Thanks very much. Sorry to bother you. Thought I knew my way around this place, but I can't find the mat room. I alerted the artist, Harris Millenshaw. I'd be poking my head in about this time, but I can't find him either. Harrison? Michael? Anybody home? You wait here. I'll find somebody who knows where they are. Look, it's all set up. All you have to do is explain what a matte painting is. This might be a good example, because I think what they have to know is that a matte painting is required when there's something that should exist in the film that can't be built or is too expensive to build. So we need to show them that a mat goes onto glass. There's an open area where we project the live action, in this case, the people. Maybe this one isn't so good to start with. I think we should start with uh, the one that's over here. Yeah, this one would be better. Michael, why don't you turn on the action plate and we'll take a look at this one. Now we can see and you can show them how the live action plate, this part here, is combined with the painting of the town. Because what they don't know is that on location there wasn't a town back here. And in the story, the man has to be walking down the road to the town. Mm -hmm. And it's very important that they understand that's the whole reason for the map painting. And I think if we explain to them that we photograph both the painting and the live action plate, this plate down here, this moving footage, photograph the two of them together, then they should get an idea of how the, how the whole system works, the whole process works. It was the October of my 12th year when the seller of lightning rods came along the road toward Greentown, Illinois, sneaking glances over his shoulder. Somewhere not far back was a terrible storm. Even now, on those special autumn days when the air smells like smoke and the twilights are orange and ash gray. After we do this one, then perhaps you should go back to this one over here. I think this one might be a little bit better example of two plates, one where we're using sky and mountains and clouds up here in this blank area of the glass up here, combined with a painting of a town and a lake and a bridge, combined once again on the bottom part with the people walking up to the gate so that they can see that there are three separate elements all combined together onto one piece of film to provide the map. This is like a, an archaeologist's dream, to go back in history and, and walk the earth as it was ten centuries ago. I suggest you forget the past and start thinking about the future, which from the look of things, I'd say, is not very promising. Get back to what we're doing, and and uh, Michael, we got to get these next door. I'm sorry, I couldn't find them anywhere. We're going to have to do this some other time. If we don't get over to orchestra stage, we're going to miss that too. One of the last steps in the making of a film is the recording of the music. And we're going to eavesdrop on one of those scoring sessions right now. The composer, James Horner, has, among other things, written the music for Star Trek II, and more recently, 48 Hours. And today, with the help of over 60 hand-picked Hollywood musicians, plus 20 female singers, he will conduct a portion of his score for the Walt Disney production of Something Wicked This Way Comes. The actual composition of the music that Mr. Horner will record today began months ago when he and the director and the producer met at what is called a spotting session. They agreed while watching a final cut of the film on which section should be underscored with music and which left silent, with particular attention always being paid to those emotional moments, the ones that might be heightened by a burst of brass or a harp glissando. When such a moment is about to occur on the screen, the conductor is alerted by Mark's called streamers or punches. You'll see them when we get inside. The streamer is a line made on the film with a grease pencil and the punch is an actual hole that's been cut into the film. If, for example, Mr. Horner wants to change the tempo just before a kiss or accentuate the string section under a chase, he'll mark those moments with either a streamer 
or a punch. That segment of the film that's being scored is projected as he conducts. And when he sees the marks, he can anticipate the moments and direct the musicians to deliver whatever he wants right down to a single frame of film. Hey, we timed that pretty good. Almost every Disney film since the company moved to this lot in 1940 has been scored on this stage. That's a lot of good music. And sometimes it seems that some of that memorable music still hangs in the air here. Perhaps encouraging a new composer or musician to carry on the old tradition. Before we start rehearsing anymore, I want to just ask, there's several things that I want to just check, if I may. Let's see if you hear this in your headsets. Yeah, so is everything set? Here we go. Three, four. Is the piano loud enough, Greg? Shellies and basses. But together. that the D-sharp on the downbeat of 157 is a D-sharp and not a C-something. Okay? 154 again. Everybody. And... Q one eight. 